If you're looking for a copy of George Orwell's 1984 classic, you won't find it in this bookshop in New York. It's become so popular that it's out of stock here. The classic novel was first published in 1949. It features a devious Big Brother government that spies on its citizens and forces them into accepting contradictory versions of the truth. Um, it's one of those great dystopian novels. Um, it deals a lot with propaganda and with our current administration. I think people are worried about that kind of thing and they want to be informed about, even though it's fiction, they want to be informed about the dangers of getting too close to that kind of reality right now. Since Trump's inauguration, sales of the novel have increased by 9,500 percent, and it's now being reprinted as readers grapple with Trump's administration's defense of alternative facts, which has been described as a different take on what the media reports. For some people, it's reminded them of Orwell's classic. In a series of nighttime tweets, Donald Trump has reaffirmed his commitment to closing the border with Mexico. Big day planned on national security tomorrow. Among many other things, we will build the wall. The campaign promise received criticism overseas, but is popular amongst his supporters. We will build a great wall along the southern border. And Mexico will pay for the wall. Trump's hoping that Mexico will eventually pay for the wall, as Congress has to approve the projected multi-billion dollar cost before building can start. But the Mexican government says it won't pay for it. The U.S. president is also expected to target legal immigrants at his trip to the Department of Homeland Security. According to the Washington Post, officials are considering whether to shut down the program that allows refugees from war-torn countries into the United States. Three, Trump will potentially bar for 30 days U.S. visas to people from Iraq, Iran, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria and Yemen until new visa procedures are developed, fulfilling his campaign promise for extreme vetting. Within Turkey's army, there are different groups. Now, not just within Turkey's army, the most important division is between the, pre the President Erdogan and the Turkish military. Now, the Turkish military is seen as the guardian of the secular, whereas Erdogan is seen as an Islamist. So there's all, there've already been tensions since his election. Now, there've been two elections in the last year, both of which Erdogan did not win a majority. And that has led to a lot of conflict, mainly because he was seen as the man who could keep Turkey stable. However, what's happened with that, as we can see in the last year and a bit, he started a war with uh, the PKK, the Kurdish uh, military group, and things have been become very unstable. Do we have any idea of uh, if this coup is put down, or if, if Erdogan has gotten the upper hand in it, who might be winning this sort of battle between uh, taking over Turkey? Well, we still have absolutely no idea. It's still developing at the moment. Um, we have both sides saying different things. The Prime Minister of Turkey is saying that this they will be taken down, calling them a terrorist organization. The military saying that they are winning, clearly with the bombs and surrounding the parliament at the moment. So we really don't know. Another day of hope for a handful of these refugee children. They could be the few who leave the jungle and try their luck across the channel. As more unaccompanied migrant children make their way to Britain to join their families. But the UK government has received accusations from religious leaders and charities of dragging its heels on helping to move refugee children out of the camp. And France has added to the wave of criticism. In a letter to The Guardian, the French interior minister Bernard Cazeneuve says... The UK government now needs to intensify this effort so that every unaccompanied minor can benefit from fair, lasting protection. He's urging the two countries to work together to fulfil its moral duty. On the 10th of October, the French interior minister and his British counterpart, Amber Rudd, agreed to speed up the refugee application process. 
So far, only 80 children this year have been accepted for asylum in the UK from France. But the charity, the Red Cross, estimates a 1,000 unaccompanied children are living in the jungle. 178 of those have ties to Britain. We pay tribute to the Home Office for what they've done, but this needs to be replicated tenfold over the next week um, for us to meet our obligations. France is expected to dismantle the jungle within the coming days and it's feared many migrant children will leave without a trace when that happens. We have to actually look as well the numbers of people uh, coming to London uh, if we're going to get a grip on, on the housing problem. So are you saying the migration and the housing crisis are both intertwined? Oh yes. We've seen a little bit that the other pundits have spoken about stop and search. Now this is mentioned in your manifesto. What are your ideas on that? Stop and search, when it's used well, it's intelligence-led, is good, a good tool in the wide range of tools that the Metropolitan Police has. But we've got to make sure the community has confidence in the police when they're using it. We've come here today with Chris Baldwin to look at the new superhighway that's just being completed here uh, around, leading up to Blackfriars Bridge. Um, we're here because I've pledged to keep this programme going. None of the other mayor, mayoral candidates have promised to continue funding the superhighway programme, but we're seeing it just starting to work. It's the beginning of a cycling revolution in London. It's about the process of how good design uh, enables you to make a successful journey through London. And in London we're surrounded by fantastic design, or almost so much of it that it's kind of hidden in plain sight. So what the exhibition does in particular is take things that are terribly familiar, like the typeface or fabrics on the tube, bus stops, whatever it might be, uh, and explains the story behind them. So it looks at how design has made London what it is in the past and how it uh, is still doing that today uh, and into the future. One of the most important things about the exhibition is that it isn't just uh, a whole bunch of fabulous designs which have arrived, you know, as if from Mars. The great thing about, the des uh, about design for transport in London is that it's a, it's a process of really good commissioning of design. So what we try and show in the exhibition in several case studies is the process of design from first sketches, first kind of graph paper representations of what a textile might look like through to a finished fabric for, 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 for Crossrail. And we think the, the, the process is the important thing. The exhibition takes you on the passenger journey um, and it's from the very beginning. So the first section looks at the decision to travel and how London Transport has encouraged people to do that through posters and guidebooks and also how we plan our journeys. So from timetables and maps to how we do how, what we use now, which is apps in a lot of cases. So once you have your, um, your, your journey planned out, you then set off on the streets and it looks at the, the street furniture and the urban landscape around you as you make your journey from the street to the mode of transport and then you finally enter the transport network and the um, network of services. And then on the second floor we look at the design process because I think if, unless you're a designer or you've worked with designers, it's a pretty hidden process and so we want to lift the lid on that a bit um, and we also have a pop-up studio where every single week we'll have different designers and design students in there and visitors can talk to them, you can talk to some of the practitioners who are designing things that you'll be using now and in the future um, and so it's really exciting to, to really unravel that process um, for, for our visitors. Pit My Bus Stop is um, us basically wanting to inspire um, our visitors to have a go at designing a bus stop. So um, when you're, whenever you've been waiting for a bus, you probably think, well, I want to maybe do something else, whether it's listening to music, have a drink, go on a swing maybe. <laughs> it's trying to, we just want people to let their imaginations run wild and to come up with all kinds of ideas and get creative. I've been here eight years and I've never seen anything like it. Today, um, St Thomas's Church will be closed while we assess the safety um, situation. There's always been women behind the scenes, but not that many in client-facing roles, and not that many women, in, you know, very few women, in sort of um, roles of you know, running the businesses within Savile Row. There have been women, you know, historically in more senior roles running businesses, but in actually having their name above the door and starting a brand new tailoring house, that's, um, a new thing for it just reflects the modern day. There's more and more women coming into the trade 
and you know I'm really happy to say that it's I'm hoping to inspire more women to do so too. The fact that I'm a woman I think is quite irrelevant to me I dismiss that because I'm, I'm a tailor and I see myself as one of them and um, I'm, I'm that first and foremost and so I've had a long training and I've been in the business for 20 years to get to this point but here it's a shop front, it's, it's an opportunity to display our work to the world and invite people to come in and understand the process of what it takes to make a bespoke suit. So we've set it out, so very much like a gallery, you can see the different sort of um, processes that you go through from client interaction initially, discussing style, 